Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm Dr. August de Oliveira. I'm a general dentist from Los Angeles, California. Um, one of the exciting things that I've introduced to my practice is uh, CIREC and Galios integration. So I've always been a big fan of CIREC. I bought uh, my first CIREC machine uh, in 2004. Um, started placing implants about five years ago and uh, quickly realized that um, Galios is the way to go to integrate with CIREC and to make uh, my implants placements a little bit more exact. Um, now with the dawn of CIREC 4.2 and the introduction of the Emax abutment block, um, I can do everything. Um, I can not only plan my implant, I can mill out my surgical guide. We'll talk a little bit about utilizing um, the CIREC guide system, uh, which is a chair side mill milled surgical guide system. Um, place the implant, wait for it to heal, image it, and mill out the final restoration, be it a screw retained crown or a custom abutment uh, utilizing my CIREC machine. So let's go ahead and go through a clinical case. Um, this case was kind of fun because we took the patient from no tooth um, to placing the implant to doing the final restoration. And as more GPs are placing implants, um, they're just getting this sense of pride where we can not only take the patient from not having a tooth, um, dentists in the past have have referred uh, implants out, and they've had the joy, obviously, of, of making the final restoration. But we can take the patient from no tooth to their final restoration, which is just really, really exciting. So um, over here we have uh, a case, patient came in, um, she had a tooth that um, had an endodontic lesion, um, previous endo, um, really, really big lesion. I recommended the patient take the tooth out. Um, she wanted to save it. Um, she went to an endodontist, had an apico, um, lasted about two years, um, and uh, the tooth reabscessed. So we extracted uh, the tooth, we cleaned out the area, we flapped it, um, we placed DFDBA, which is demineralized freeze dried bone aggregate, which is a human cadaver bone. Uh, we placed it, we placed a membrane, we let it heal. Um, saw the patient about three months later um, to go ahead and start the process. So um, if you're familiar with placing implants, you know that you can lay a flap, place the implant, old school, or we can do what's called guided surgery. So guided surgery, we plan the implant uh, with the help of a cone beam scan. We have a surgical guide fabricated, usually from a lab, um, which takes time. It takes about six days, and it costs a little bit over $300 um, for a single tooth guide. Um, we now have the ability to mill out our surgical guides in-house utilizing the CIREC guide system. So the first step of doing a CIREC guide is to kind of size up the edentulous space. So in the image that you see, um, there's the orange thing, and the orange thing is called a reference body. What the reference body does is it provides a shape that CIREC is going to mill out, um, it also contains markers, and we call these fiducial markers. Fiducial markers allow us to translate what we see in a cone beam scan into what CIREC can mill out. So when a patient comes in and needs an implant, my first step is to try in the reference body. So in this case, the orange reference body is the smallest size that we have. So we want to use the largest reference body we can place in the edentulous space. So once we size things up, we take an alginate um, of the patient and we pour it up in stone or some sort of dye material. And we fabricate something called a radiographic guide. What it does is it carries this orange piece into the mouth and we scan the patient. We scan the patient two ways. We do a radiographic scan, which is a cone beam. If you guys are familiar with cone beam, it's a CT scan of the patient. It's a three-dimensional x-ray. What we also do is we overlay that with an optical scan, so CIREC. And CIREC is a great way of capturing a lot of data we don't have in a cone beam scan. Uh, CIREC can capture the gingiva. It can capture the contours of the teeth below the height of contour and can really dial in what we do. The next step is to combine the data. So the patient is wearing this reference body that orange thing you saw in the last picture, and getting their cone beam scan. We plan the implant in relation to the adjacent teeth, so there's certain landmarks that we need. Uh, we need to be at least 1.5 millimeters away from the adjacent teeth. We need at least two millimeters of bone, buckle, and lingual to the, to the implant, 
the attached tissue or the keratinized tissue, we need a band of at least two millimeters around that. So we combine the CIRAC data with the Galileo's data. So in CIRAC, you're probably familiar with an RST file. An RST file is the output for getting a crown that you could mill in your MCXL. To output to Galileo's, we need to send it in a different file type. We call that an SSI file. So once in Galileo's, we bring in the CIRAC data as an SSI file and display it in the scan. You can see in the image, um, we have a yellow model. Um, it's not cool and colorful, uh, but that should be coming soon. Um, we plan the implant in relation to the crown. And what I do, and every dentist is different, but I try to do a screw retain final restoration whenever I can. And those of us that have restored implants that are poorly placed know that to do a screw retain restoration, we have a screw access hole. And that screw access hole should be going in posterior teeth through the central fissures and anterior teeth, it should be going into the cingula uh, of those teeth. So in this case here, we want our implant to go through it. Now, in the image, you might see a yellow pole that is coming out of my CIRAC restoration. That's called the pilot drill path. The pilot drill path basically does two things. It says where our first drill is going to go, so it warns us if we are going to bang into adjacent teeth. But what it also does is tells us where the final screw axis will be in our crown. We can predict uh, before we even place the implant if we need to go with a separate custom abutment or a, and a separate crown, or we can do this as a screw retain restoration. So if you look at the image there, obviously we're in the center of the tooth and that's great. What I also like to do is turn off the CIRAC proposal and look at the edentulous space in relation to the adjacent teeth. Why do I do that? Well, we know a couple of things. Um, we know that um, in order to get good papilla growth around our implants, we can be no deeper than five millimeters from the base of the contact. So when I'm scanning this patient in CIRAC, I'm making it a point to really rotate the camera, get underneath the contacts, and see that we call the gingival coal, or basically the area below the contacts, so that I can adequately predict if we'll get papilla growth. Is it totally crucial in a posterior tooth? No, but it looks more awesome if you have papillae. It is very, very crucial though in the anterior. So once we've planned our implant, we're going to export that data into CIRAC, and CIRAC is going to mill out a portion called the drill body. So if you look at this image here, we have this yellow stuff with a CIRA guide keys. That yellow stuff is a thermoplastic tray material. That initial orange piece that we, saw, we showed in the beginning made an indentation that CIRAC is going to mill to. Once we've put the pieces together, it's no different than any other guided surgery. So we have keys, we have drills. So we drill through this guide, uh, we place our implant. I personally like to take the CIRAC guide out of the mouth and place my implant into the, uh, the osteotomy directly. Um, just a matter of personal opinion. Um, some people do like to place the implant through the CIRAC guide. Um, I would be leery of bumping into the CIRAC guide, which may not be as surgically sterile as something that would be metal. Uh, keep in mind, this is made out of plastic. But uh, went ahead, placed the implant in the edentulous space. Um, in this case, we used an implant direct legacy uh, implant. Obviously, you can use whatever implant system you want that works with your CIRAC guide keys. So we have a choice here. Um, there's different ways of placing implants. A conventional way is to place the implant, some, place some sort of a healing uh, cap or healing abutment. Um, the other way is to immediately temporize. So for single units, we don't want to immediately load. Um, that's a term that's thrown around a lot. Immediate loading means that you're placing an implant and you're placing an occlusion. Uh, immediate temporization means we're putting a temporary on it, but it's not in bite. In this case, we did not have enough torque to be able to place a temporary at the time. Um, basically, I like to be at, with at least 35 Newton centimeters of torque. In this case, we did not have it. It was a recent graft. Um, for whatever reason, we maybe got 20 Newton centimeters of torque. So in this case, we did not immediately temporize. We placed a healing abutment and send the patient on the way. Uh, they came back four months later. I like to wait four months on the upper, three months on the lower. So patient came back, she's ready for her final restoration. 
So what we did was we placed something called a scan post. Now, if you've been using CIRIC for a while, um, you know what a tie base is. So a tie base is a metal portion that goes within the final restoration. And in the past, we used to be able to scan uh, tie bases on models. Um, they had a little white cap. In the mouth, the tie base is way too short. So we need to use something called a scan post. A scan post is something that goes into the implant. It has a notch or a bump um, on the front, which corresponds to whatever element of the internal connection is facing buccally. So if you're using a hex type implant, you'll have the flat of a hex on the buckle. If you're using a trilobe, the point of the trilobe will face buccally as well. So we place a scan post, we place a gray cap if you're using the Omnicam, or a white cap if you're using the blue cam, um, and scan in the mouth. The problem is the size of the scan post in relation to adjacent teeth in tight situations. Scan post really tall. So when you're scanning in the mouth, you're moving the camera around, it's very easy to not be able to get into the interproximal. So I figured out a little trick. Um, we need to take two scans of the edentulous space. Uh, one scan is the gingival mask, which is no different than the gingival mask you may have on an old school polyvinyl impression. It captures the gingiva in relationship to the implant. So my first scan that I ever take is I take the healing abutment off the implant, I scan for the gingival mask. There's no scan post in there, so I can really get into the edentula space, really capture the contact area, get down below the contact area, and capture all that data as well. What I do then, if you look at the picture here, is I duplicate that. So we go ahead and we copy the gingival mask, we move it into the folder of your restoration, so obviously it's gonna be the upper, if you're doing an upper, or a lower if you're doing a lower. Go ahead and utilize uh, the tools, which are on the right side of the screen, and select Cut. So what we're going to do is cut out where the healing abutment is and replace that data with a scan post. What did we just do? We captured the contacts, we've got all the gingiva, and all we're doing now is duplicating the scan post. So once we do that, the data stitches up nicely and we can move forward. Here's just an image of both an intraoral photo and uh, what things look like in CIRIC 4.2 with the scan post. You can see that triangle on the scan post. Basically, it's like a barcode reader. We scan that, it gives basically three-dimensional information of where the, the implant is in space. Um, no different than a uh, impression coping or whatever you would use. Um, so this translates into CIRIC. If you look at the picture, it's hard to see but in the upper right hand side, you can see those contact areas. The contact areas are very well represented. It was because of that cut technique. So now we can really see in there. I love the new Emacs abutment block, um, and there's a lot of things to love about it. Um, although I've been a big fan of utilizing zirconia abutments in the past, I found them to be a little too chalky. Um, Emacs comes with two different sizes. Um, the four, size 14 line comes in the MO. Uh, the MO, if you guys remember when Emacs first came out, stands for mono-opaque. It's a fairly opaque block. Why is it opaque? Well, abutments tend to be fairly thin, and we have the tie base below it, so we need a more opaque porcelain to mask out the tie base. So typically, the 14 blocks are used for just custom abutments, not for screw-retained crowns. The 16 block is much bigger, um, and you can use it for both an abutment or a screw-retained crown. Obviously, I would use it more for a screw retained crown. It's bigger and it takes a long time to mill. So in this case, we utilized, I believe, an A2 um, size 16L block and milled it out. Everyone's different. Um, there's a principle called indexing. So indexing means your implant is facing a certain way. Um, when you place your tie base in there, sometimes there's quite a bit of gingiva um, in the way or your scan post. Um, so I never really trust sometimes that I'm down all the way. So when I mill out the Emacs block, I always like to, to still try it in in the blue state. Make sure it's indexed well, make sure it fits the tie base well um, that we're doing. I go through and I check the occlusion, I check the contacts, make sure everything is fine. Um, everyone's different with occlusion. Um, I personally like the occlusion on my implants to be on the lighter side. Um, I don't like it to be in function. 
Um, I don't like it crazy out of occlusion, but I do like it to be light in occlusion. This is just kind of a cool image. Um, what are we trying to do in guided surgery? Well, in guided surgery, our goal is to plan an implant in a computer game, um, mill out a guide or send out for a surgical guide, place the implant, but make sure that implant goes to where we planned. So one interesting thing we can do is compare that pilot drill path, that pole I talked about before, and combine it with what we get with the Emacs final restoration. That screw access hole should be where that pilot drill path is. You can see in the upper right hand side, that was our original Galileos image. In the upper, I'm sorry, the upper left hand side. In the upper right hand side, we can see the uh, Xerox scan. We're in the exact same position. So this is what guided surgery is all about. Um, whatever we plan, the implant ends up where it is, and we get to the final restoration. We have an easy time doing the final restoration. I'm selfish. Um, I want to make sure that my implants go where they are so when it comes time for me to restore it, I'm not spending two hours designing this thing. And um, you can see where we planned the implant is where things ended up. Here's our final restoration. You know, when Emacs first came out with their abutment blocks, I think that the big thing that we were excited about was that we didn't have to buy a separate zirconia furnace and the sintering time was 20 or 30 minutes. I think what most of us are realize utilizing this in our practice is the translucency is just awesome. They say patients don't come to us for implants, they come to us for teeth. And in the past, we've had this crutch of implant crowns looking weird or chalky or not like normal teeth. Um, these Emacs things, they look like teeth. Their translucency is great. Um, and so when we place a, uh, the implant in, what I like to do personally is I, I place an endodontic sponge over the screw um, over the hex of the screw. What that does is it's a very hydrophobic material. Some people like cotton, some people like Teflon tape. Um, I like the endodontic sponge, it's easy to pack. Um, but what I like to do is use a combination of flowable and regular composite uh, that's opaque. So what we wanna do is block out that access and make things look real. Um, so I start with a very, very, very white, very flowable composite. Um, it's almost like white out. Uh, they use composite over it. I might get fancy and use some ochre stain just to kind of blend in the stain that I did. You don't have to, but it looks kind of cool. Um, but if you look at the picture here, you can see the difference between, and I know this is not an implant crown, but there's a PFM on tooth number five um, that we did endo on. And look at the access in the PFM versus my closed access on the Emax crown. Quite a big difference in translucency. So with the PFM, we don't have light coming through the tooth. Um, it's very, very blocked out and very dark. And even if you use opaque composites through a PFM screw access, it's still just really ugly. Um, so what we get with Emacs is just this beautiful vitality that we just can't get anywhere else. So that's it uh, from beginning to end. So again, um, it's so exciting to do this. Uh, it's such a great service for your patients. Um, Syrac and Galios are just two awesome tools in my practice that allow me um, to do this stuff really on a weekly basis. There's probably not a week that goes by that I'm not combining Syrac with Galios, placing implants, restoring them with Syrac. So uh, very cool stuff. So thank you for your attention and uh, see you later.